Okay, so mammals as a group are named after one of their reproductive mm -hmm. characters in the development of mammary glands, which is um, unique to mammals in the development of milk and to provide for their young. Um, there are a couple other vertebrates who do something similar, but it's not the same, uh, the same structures and the same development. Um, but there are many different various modes of reproduction and anatomy and variety and diversity within uh, the mammal groups, and we'll go through some of these. But first, the general characteristics of mammary glands, the production of milk, and with that then, the social bond between mother and young, which is also variable in its um, importance in the development of young, um, probably occurred in the late Triassic period. Um, and then this live birth, which is uh, sometimes attributed to mammals, although there are non-live um, bearing mammals um, in monotremes. Um, that is something that then occurred later after these developments. Um, so we'll go briefly through some of the male anatomy and then spend most of our time talking about the female anatomy because that's where most of the important parts of reproduction occur. So the gonads for males, uh, the gonads are where meiosis occurs, where gametes are formed, is in the testes. Um, and these are the same embryonic structures as the female um, gonads. Um, and they, of course, produce sperm. All right. Um, the spermatogonia then are the um, stem cells, which then develop and divide into spermatozoa. Um, generally have a head and a tail um, and are fully mature as sperm. The testes then are where these gonads um, reside and they can be internal or external. External generally is an um, e evagination of the abdominal cavity um, and um, even within species, they can be external at some point when the testes descend. Um, and later in a non-breeding part of the season, uh, they can be pulled back up into the abdominal uh, cavity um, and become internal. But they are housed within a scrotum, um, which then you know, keeps them at a different temperature so the sperm can uh, mature. The penis is the intermittent organ re, uh, used in coitus for delivering sperm within the female reproductive tract. There are uh, different types of penises. Uh, musculocavernosis is um, fills with blood or engorges with blood and is made of uh, mostly muscle. Uh, osteomuscular cavernosis, uh, cavernosis muscles, or sorry, penises have a bone in, included with um, tissue that fills with and engorges with blood. Um, and then a fibroelastic penis, which is mostly um, connective tissue and it's coiled um, and then um, is erect through a, a tendon. Um, there is a lot of variation in, in penis anatomy. Some of the characters um, depend on the life history and um, female reproductive traits, such as barbs on the tip of the penis called the glands. These are found in uh, bats, and it is thought that they are there to remove plugs which form um, in the female reproductive tract that cover the cervix, so therefore removing these copulatory plugs. Um, also, some mammals have very l large penis and testes um, when compared to their body size, such as the bowhead whale and sperm whales. And it is thought that large penis and large testes is for producing copious amounts of sperm in reproductive strategies where they have um, polygamous or uh, promiscuous reproductive patterns and the sperm competition. So the amount of sperm and the quality of sperm is important for allowing for fertilization in males. Okay, so now on to the female anatomy. The gonads are the ovaries. Um, they produce the ova or the eggs um, and the ogonia then are the uh, stem cells which then uh, go through mitosis and divide into the ovums 
ovum, ova, or eggs. And uh, this occurs in uh, in utero. So a as the fetus and uh, as the fetus develops is when the all the cell division occurs. So a female is born with all the eggs, which she can then develop into mature uh, eggs for the process of fertilization to occur. So it's fixed at birth. It doesn't. You don't have more meiosis occurring after birth. Or so you don't have uh, more mitotic events, um, which could lead to the completion of meiosis. So the female reproductive tract again, there is a diversity there as well. So I see you, I have here a marsupial um, re female reproductive tract. The vagina is forked and also has this middle uh, section, which eventually becomes the birth canal. Um, and then there are actually two separate uteruses with separate cervix services um, on each side. Um, but from the ovary where ovulation occurs, there is an infundibulum or a cup-shaped part which leads into the uterine tube, which then leads into the cervix, which then connects, sorry, the uterus. Uh, and then the cervix separates the uterus from the vagina, and the vagina then for to the um, external opening. Monotremes, however, have a cloaca where the um, urinary, reproductive, and digestive tract all meet in the same opening. But the um, therians, metatherians have uh, separate openings. Monotremes then are unique in that they still retain the ancestral characteristic of, of laying an amniotic egg. Uh, they are, however, a little bit different than reptilian eggs. They are generally um, incubated for a short amount of time, and then the very small young emerges and immediately starts feeding on milk. The egg then has less yolk, but the uh, neonate has a, an egg tooth for helping hatch from its egg, um, but then it spends most of its time uh, developing through the energy it receives through milk. Metatherians and eutherians then have different reproductive um, characteristics in how long they nurse. Uh, metatherians generally have very small young, so they aren't in gestation very long, but they spend a lot of time uh, nursing. Whereas eutherians generally have very a large young, so they spend a long time in gestation and a very short lactation time. And this is called precocial young, so they are, they are generally more developed when they are born. Um, altricial young are, are generally less developed when they are young. There are a lot of gradations within the pattern as well, but you can see from this graphic, um, our metatherians then spend much less time in gestation and more time in lactation, and eutherians are the opposite. It appears that eutherians are more efficient in this reproductive pattern. Um, they can produce young at a faster rate, uh, and then that has allowed them, at least some of them, to displace many um, metatherians in places like Australia where they are abundant. The estrus cycle then is the period of, well, estrus itself is refers to this um, when females are in heat or the time in which they are receptive to mating um, and fertilization can then occur shortly thereafter. Um, the estrous cycle is, uh, has a couple components to it. Your, the um, uterus has to prepare itself for implantation, as well as the ovary has to prepare itself to release the ovary. So you have these things kind of happening in tandem to allow for fertilization and implantation to occur. Menstruation occurs when the uterine wall or the endometrium um, is shed rather than absorbed. Okay, Both of them have the development of the uterine wall or the endometrium to accept a fertilized egg or for implantation to occur. However, if that does not occur, then it is either shed or res resorbed. In a monoesterous, estrous cycle that they have once per year and generally are a you know during a breeding season so you have that down here polyesterous 
they are continually um, going through different a, a different cycle and releasing eggs multiple times throughout the uh, throughout the year. And you have different variations of those as well. You can see on this graphic. Uh, the four stages of the estrus cycle are proestrus. During this, the follicle develops. Um, and the follicle stimulating hormone is what allow these follicles to develop and a antral follicle, a dominant follicle will develop. Um, the estrus cycle then, or the estrus um, period is where ovulation occurs. So this is generally where copulation will occur or copulation during this time will result hopefully or um, ideally in uh, fertilization and then in metastris that is where uh, the implantation will occur if it doesn't occur then you will move on to diestrus where you kind of reset so the endometrium is then shed or resorbed during diestrus um, and then another follicle starts to um, mature as you go into proestrus Anestrus occurs in monoestrous animals where they have a non-breeding or inactive period. Um, and it is not considered one of the four other stages, but you will have this inactive period um, when, let's say if you have horses which breed only once per year, um, the time in which it's non-breeding season would be anestrous. Oops, so there they are. Sorry, I thought they were coming up as I was saying them. Um, ovulation can be both spon um, either spontaneous or induced. In spontaneous ovulation, um, the ovum will be released without stimulation, and that happens in humans. Here is one being released right here. Um, induced ovulation occurs uh, when some sort of stimulation, either mating behavior or um, even coitus itself causes then ovulation to occur. Um, and so that ovum is retained until after that stimulation occurs. Um, all right, so if fertilization takes place, and this generally happens in the uterine tube, uh, peristalsis or contractions down the uterine tube then propel the zygote as it starts to develop and go through cell division. So it then um, becomes a marula, a ball of cells, and then a blastocyst, which is a hollow ball of cells, and then uh, the outer layer releases and a trophoblast forms. The trophoblast then helps implantation to occur into the uh, endometrium. After that occurs, then you will have the formation of the placenta. Uh, generally, the yolk is what initially um, allows nutrients um, for the developing um, embryo. And then after the placenta is fully formed, that then will allow for nutrients uh, to occur through that way. So an embryo is uh, generally early in development, general, uh, or always early in development, and then a certain point after implantation, when the placenta is formed, you have then a fetus. Um, there's a lot of variation in placenta types, um, depending on uh, the connection between the chorion, which is the outer um, embryonic tissue, and uh, what tissues then the elentois or the yolk sac um, exchange with uh, that outer tissue. Placental efficiency then is a function of two things, the layers between the maternal blood su supply of the endometrium. Uh, if that is reduced, uh, then you can have exchange occurring at a faster rate or increasing the surface area of the absorptive layers. So you can take that chorion and um, you know, make projections such as villi, um, which would then increase the surface area and then increase the amount of exchange occurring. So then the villi themselves can be arranged in different um, patterns 
and those are different placenta types here. So a cotyledonary placenta, these dark areas are where you have concentrations of the villi. And you can see it's in these round areas throughout the um, placenta. Or you can have a diffuse placenta where it's kind of evenly um, spaced throughout the placenta. You can have a zonary placenta where it's one band or a discoidal placenta where it's across one um, large area. So those are the different placenta types. All right, so once then um, the uh, fetus has come to full term and is ready for birth, uh, the process of parturition or birth occurs. Now, during pregnancy, the corpus luteum secretes progesterone, and that's going to inhibit this birth process. Um, but towards full term, then you're going to have a decrease in progesterone. Um, and an increase in estrogen. And then there are other hormones involved which are important. So cortisol helps the lungs to mature so breathing can occur shortly after birth. Um, that mix between estrogen increased and progest progesterone decreasing allows the myometrium to contract which is gonna push the baby out. The cervix is going to soften. soften. There's a mucus plug that releases um, it, the cervix will dilate or get much larger to allow the, um, the baby to pass through. And then prolactin is also released to help develop mammary glands. There's also prostaglandins, which are important in that process. And as you can see, it's a big, there are a lot of interplay and a lot of feedback processes between these hormones going on at the same time. Um, but as these all things come together, then you have myometrium contractions, which push the baby out of the vaginal uh, birth canal after it is born then you have an afterbirth of the placenta and the placenta has to then separate um, from the endometrium and then the endometrium afterbirth will uh, and the uterus will contract and get into a smaller form and then we'll go through periods of uh, you know tissue um, regeneration and, and reshaping after birth, you then have the development of uh, the mammary glands and lactation occurring. This requires a high investment of energy for the mother, um, more, more so, if not at least as much as the process of, of forming or, or exchanging energy to the growing embryo or fetus. Um, so it requires an increase of food intake or I mean, the food intake may have occurred before um, birth and have an increase in fat storage or digestive efficiency. Um, and seals kind of show, seals, walruses, marine mammals show kind of a range of this. Either they have um, acquired a lot of resources which allow them to have lots of blubber which they can then uh, metabolize into milk or they can go through these fasting and feeding bouts where they will leave the babe, leave the pup, and then go out and feed until they have enough energy to lactate again. Um, the hormones during pregnancy develop the mammary glands but prevent milk production. Then once um, birth occurs, um, there are a couple stimuli that release and develop milk. So first is the, the prostaglandins, or sorry, the prolactin, which then increases the development of milk tissues and suckling then also causes the release of milk um, and the release of oxytocin which also stimulates the, the milk to come down. Uh, Metatherians can produce different types of milk depending on whether they are in early or late lactogenesis. So if it's early then it's very small young and the, the milk is generally high in sugars and then later it's going to be high in fat. Um, Therians, however, generally have a very constant fat content in their milk, um, but it can vary between species. So marine mammals, again, have high fat content in their um, milk, and then other animals can have lower concentrations of fat. All right, so some patterns which are very interesting in mammals. Uh, delayed pregnancy can occur in a few different uh, forms. Um, one of them is the process of just delayed fertilization. So mating will occur um, during the, the mating season, 
but the female will store the sperm until conditions are more favorable. This occurs in bats. Um, delayed implantation is the same sort of thing, but the fertilization does occur in, during the breeding season, but then it doesn't implant until later, so it remains in this small um, um, stage until it's ready. Okay, so delayed implantation then occurs in bats as well. Not all bats do this, but certain species of bat. And also some carnivorans, um, artiodactylans, uh, pelosins, and some metatherians as well. Um, delayed development then is where implantation does occur, but it remains in this underdeveloped state for a period of time. And this also occurs in species of bats. Um, and really the reasons for this is generally because there's some sort of mismatch between the breeding season and when you want birth to occur. Um, so this, or there, you know, so there may be some sort of separation between the second sexes, um, where for the timing to be at, reproduction um, would have to occur at a different time when they are separate, or hibernation or other life history traits, which would uh, make it not ideal to have a, a, a direct development. So uh, there are things then which affect the reproductive timing, so when estrus is going to occur. Um, most generally this is, if, you, if they have a breeding season, this is influenced by the photo period, so how much light and dark there is, so that can tell you, of course, whether it's going to be spring or summer, fall, or so on. Horses, of, horses again, are an example of a, a monoestrous species which rely on this photo period. Temperature has less of an influence and is variable, you know, hard to determine actually how much influence temperature has. Um, generally the photo period is more significant than temperature. Um, nutrition and energy however is very important. So if a female does not have enough nutrients then it will not ovulate. Um, that is the case for humans as well. Um, this can also affect spermatogenesis, especially in very small animals where the cost of making sperm is much higher than in very large animals. Um, and so there needs to be enough energy available to do that. But once when pregnant, uh, then generally all of resources then go into making uh, the pregnancy viable. Pheromones are also important for understanding, um, you know, who in the area is in estrus, what other competitors um, uh, for sexual selection are in the area, or maybe a mode for sexual selection itself. So they're very important. Generally, urine is provides all of that information, and so you'll see like wolves will, you know, mark their territory and also communicate with other species through these olfactory means um, to communicate with both males and females in the area. Okay, so finally, uh, this concept which we've talked about a little bit, but we'll define more clearly, um, the difference between altricial and precocial young. So altricial young <clears throat> are generally born in unstable stable conditions with unpredictable food. And the, the, again, altricial young are these underdeveloped, um, you know, gestation is generally smaller, lactation is generally greater in the amount of time in its life. So, you know, they don't have hair, they can't see yet, there's still a lot of development that needs to occur. This is generally done when large litters, and all of them are, are altricial, um, and if uh, conditions then change, become unfavorable, then generally less will survive to adulthood. Generally born in a nest, uh, lactation is generally short, and the life cycle itself is generally short. So you generally find this in you know small rodents, insectivores, and so forth. Precocial young, however, are generally in stable environments with predictable food and resources. Um, they have small litters, or sometimes even one or two, such as in ungulates, such as this. Um, uh, antelope um, and they have very large young which are very generally very developed so this one has its eyes and hair and it can run almost immediately after being born um, 
and the gestation and lactation period is generally uh, long. And the life cycle of these animals is generally longer as well. They're generally larger. Um, and so these are two, again, uh, ends of a spectrum. You can have plenty of animals which kind of meet some of both of these um, different characteristics, um, including humans. So where do humans, would you say humans are altricial or precocial? Another way to kind of looking at this is altricial young. This is more of an R strategist, an opportunistic, where resources are spotty and patchy, uh, whereas precocial young are more a K strategy, um, where resources are more stable and predictable. Okay, that's it for mammalian reproduction.